The preface to book one. This preface should be carefully read by the student. I would say that about the preface to the Quran and some other things too. In this volume, which I have written chiefly for the information of those who are guileless and indefatigable in their inquiries into true occultism, magical art, and the spiritual power of the human soul, I have, at a vast labor and expense, both of time and charges, collected whatsoever can be deemed valuable and rare in regard to the subject of Hindu and natural magic, Indian occultism, the Kabbalah, celestial and ceremonial magic. I don't know, are we going to find out about the Hindi and other Indian numerology here? Celestial and ceremonial magic, alchemy and spiritism, and I've divided it into two books, subdivided into chapters. And in this volume will also be found a biographical account of those great men who were famous and renowned for their knowledge, showing upon whose authority this science of art magic is found, and upon what principles, to which I have annexed a great variety of notes, wherein I have impartially examined the probability of the existence of magic, both of the good and bad species. Well, magic is the art and science of religion, the change of consciousness. I would say no matter what, you'd have to say that that exists. Now, magical powers, what do you mean? And, you know, that might vary, right? In the earliest as well as in the later ages of the world, I have exhibited a vast number of rare experiments in the course of this treatise, many of which, delivered in the beginning, are founded upon the simple application of actives to passives. The others are of a higher astral influence. In my history of the lives of the great philosophers, I have omitted nothing that can be called interesting or satisfactory. I have taken my historical characters from those philosophers and adepts most deserving of credit. I have given an outline of the various reports tradition gives of them, to which are next notes, drawn from the most probable appearance of truth and partiality, describing their characters and actions, leaning neither to the side of those who doubt everything, nor to them whose credulity takes in every report to be circumstantially true. At this time, Hindu magic, Indian occultism, and spirit art are more investigated than for a century past, during which space they have been almost totally neglected, but men, becoming more enlightened, they begin to consider the extraordinary effects that were wrought by ancient philosophers in ages that were called dark. Many, therefore, have thought that time, nature, causes, and effects being the same with the additional improvements of mechanical and liberal arts, we may, with their knowledge of nature, surpass them in the producing of wonderful effects, for which cause many men are naturally impelled without education or other advantage to dive into co the contemplation of Hindu magic and Indian occultism. But the study thereof being at first difficult, they have recourse to lay out a great deal of money in collecting various books. To remedy this inconvenience and expense, I have herewith combined with the great book of magical art, the book of secret Hindu ceremonial and talismanic magic, as book two will show, presuming that my labors herein will meet with the general approbation of either the student or disciple for whose use and instruction it is now published. But to return to the subject of this volume, I have in chapter four fully explained what natural magic is, and have shown that by the application of actives to passives, many wonderful effects are produced that are merely natural and done by manual operations. I have procured everything that was valuable and scarce respecting this department of my work, which I have introduced under the title of natural magic, and a variety of my own experiments likewise. In the possession of this work, the laborious and diligent student will find a complete and delectable companion, so that he who has been searching for years for this author and the other will in this volume find the marrow of them all. But I would advise that thee, 
do not depend too much upon thy own wisdom in the understanding of these mysteries. For all earthly wisdom is foolishness in the esteem of the power within thy own soul. God, I mean all the wisdom of man which he pretends to draw from any other source than the spiritual power within his own soul, which is God. You know, God is in me, I am in God, but, you know, God is not this creation. I have, in chapter 6 of Book 1, treated of the art called the constellatory practice, or talismanic magic, in which I fully demonstrate the power and efficacy of talismans, so much talked of and so little understood by most men. I therefore explain in the clearest and most intelligible manner how talismans can be made for the execution of various purposes, and by what means and from what source they become vivified, and are visibly instruments of great and wonderful effects. I likewise show the proper and convenient times under what constellations and aspects of the planets they are to be formed, and the times when they are most powerful of act, and in the next place I have taught that your own spirit is the vehicle of celestial attraction, transferring celestial and spiritual virtue into seals, images, amulets, rings, papers, glasses, and so on. Also, I have not forgot to give the most clear and rational illustration of sympathy and antipathy, attraction and repulsion. You know, it's not just the law of attraction, it's, it's the other too, right? I have likewise proved how cures are performed by virtue of sympathetic powers and medicines, also called contagious magic. But by seals, rings, amulets, even at unlimited distances, which I have been witness of, and am daily confirmed in the true and certain belief of, I know how to communicate with any person and give him intimation of my purpose at a hundred or a thousand miles distance. But then a preparation is necessary, and the parties should have their appointed seasons and hours for that purpose. Likewise, both should be of the same firm constancy of mine, and a disciple or brother of this art. There is also given methods whereby a man might receive true and certain intimation of future things by dreams or visions. Same thing, really. Um, visions is not in there, but dreams is in parentheses. Of whatsoever his mind has before meditated upon, himself being properly disposed. Likewise, there is recited the various methods used by Hindu adepts and yogis for the invocation of astral spirits by circles, crystals, etc., their forms of exorcism, incantations, orations, bonds, conjurations, and have given a general display of the instruments of the art, all of which I have subjoined notes, endeavoring to point out. That sounds a plated woodpecker. The difference of these arts, so as to free the name of magic from any scandalous imputation, seeing that it is a word originally significative not of any evil, but of every good and laudable science. Yeah, it used to refer to skillness more than anything else. Such as a man might profit by and become both wise and happy, and the practice so far as being from being offensive to truth or man, at that very root or ground of all magic takes its rise from within the human soul, viz. the fear of God, life, that is the beginning of all wisdom, and charity is the end. Wisdom is the beginning of magic, for magic is wisdom, and on this occasion the wise men were called magi. The magicians were the first Christians for their high and excellent knowledge. They knew that this, uh, they knew that Savior which was promised was now born man, and that Christ was our Redeemer, Advocate, and Mediator. Well, did they, or did they just project that a bit? They were the first to acknowledge his glory and majesty. Therefore, let no one be offended at the vulnerable and sacred title of magician, a title which every wise man merits while he pursues that path which Christ himself trod, these humility, charity, mercy, fasting, praying, etc., for the true magician is the truest Christian, 
and the nearest disciple of Jesus, who set the example every occult student must follow, for he says, if ye have faith, and so on, and this comes not by fasting and prayer, and so on, and ye shall tread upon scorpions, and so on, and again be wise as serpents, and harmless as doves, well, innocent as doves is actually a better translation there, but such instructions as these are frequently named, and given in every occult temple, likewise, all the apostles confess the power of working miracles through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, all the Christian ones anyways. Um, so Paul's buddies. And that all wisdom is to be attained through him. For he says, I'm the light of the world. Well, you're supposed to have faith in all the prophets. So it's the same principle, really. Um, I have thought it advisable, likewise, to investigate the power of numbers, their sympathy with the divine names of spirits, and seeing the whole universe was created by number, weight, and measure, there is no small efficacy in numbers, because nothing is more clear, nothing more clearly represents the divine essence to human understanding than numbers, seeing that in all the divine holy names there is still a conformity of numbers. So that the conclusion of Book 1 forms a complete system of mathematical magic in which I have collected a vast number of secret seals from the famous Hindu masters, and likewise from my brother Adepts, noting them particularly, as I have found them correspondent with true science on experiment. Chapter 8 in Book 1 forms a complete treatise on the mysteries of the Kabbalah and ceremonial magic, by the study of which a student who can separate himself from material objects by the mortification of the sensual appetite, abstinence from drunkenness, gluttony, and other bestial passions, and who lives pure and temperate, free from those actions which de degenerate a man to a brute, may become recipient of divine light and knowledge, by which they may foresee things to come." whether to private families or kingdoms or states, empires, battles, victories, and so on, and likewise be capable of doing much good to their fellow creatures, such as the healing of all disorders and assisting with the comforts of life, the unfortunate and distressed. Now, let's not be fooled that our modern secular magic, uh, uh, our modern secular medicine and, and all, all that stuff didn't come from paths where it wasn't, you know, included with religion. You know, all these herbs and, and, and minerals and stuff like this that they use to process the medicines, the alchemy that became our modern chemistry and awareness practices and massage and even surgery and, yeah. I have spoken largely of prophetic dreams and visions in my Kabbalistic magic and have given the tables of the Kabbalah fully set down for the information of the wise. Some few most secret and terrible things being reserved by the author for his personal pupils only, not to be taught by publication or by correspondence. Chapter 10 in Book 1 gives a complete ancient biography of which has been the result of much labor in acquiring. Therefore, those who wish to benefit from these magical studies must shake off the drowsiness of worldly vanity, all idle levity, sloth, and temperance, and lust, so that they may be quite clean, pure, and free from every distraction and perturbation of mind, and worthily use the knowledge he obtains from his labors. Therefore, my good friend, whosoever thou art that desires to accomplish these things, but... Be persuaded first to apply thyself to the eternal wisdom, entreating wisdom to grant thee understanding and seeking knowledge with diligence, and thou shalt never repent by having taken so laudable a resolution, but thou shalt enjoy a secret happiness, a serenity of soul, which the world can never rob thee of, wishing thee every success imaginable in thy studies and experiments, hoping that thou wilt use the benefits that thou mayest receive to the honor of thy Creator and... My brother adepts both in spirit and earth life, 
who have so ably assisted me in placing this knowledge before thee, my friend, and for the benefit of thy neighbor, in which exercise thou shalt ever experience the satisfaction of doing thy duty, remember my instructions to be silent. Talk only with those worthy of thy communication. Do not give pearls to swine. Be friendly to all, but not familiar with all. For many are wolves and chiefs in sheep clothing. Um, L. W. De Lawrence and one of the things is we draw the comparison. Our knowledge is but a draw compared to what can be, and the more we go on in this existence, the science indicates that the more we know, the more we know we don't know. Um, that's, that's, that's really how it is. Um, and... Worldly knowledge is like a fragment of the other. The spiritual knowledge can include those aspects of worldly knowledge. That's one thing that we can think of with all that. Um, so we've had the preface, the introduction to the faithful and discreet disciple of wisdom, epistle to the disciple, author's notice to the disciple, but we're going to get into... Oh, the introduction to book one is still to follow here. Um, Authors notice his disciples. Book one, the king and the disciple, the great spirit. This Is that just the way of talking about God is holy? Thou art admonished for thy soul's sake. Chapter three, chapter four, natural magic. Chapter five, alchemy, alchemical magic. Chapter six, al talismanic magic, the composition of talismans. Chapter seven, Mamiola magical and magical attraction. Well, that's a nice way of saying necromancy, right? Uh, the first principle of magic. In chapter 8, the celestial magic, mysterious secrets of the Kabbalah. Chapter 9, the book of secrets. Chapter 10, ancient biographia. The contents of book 2. We got the preface, the introduction. Chapter 11, a restitution of stolen robes. Chapter 12, What Are the Facts? The Ethics of Paganism. Non-Christian religion is what I'm, what they mean, I'm sure. Um, we'll find out specifically. Um, the Luminous Star of Bethlehem, because paganism isn't the same thing as, in a literal sense, the Romans and the Greeks didn't use terms like pagan and heathen to distinguish religions, but The Luminous Star of Bethlehem, Chapter 13, Spiritualism and Religion, Chapter 14, Lessons in the Deathship, Fort. Uh, clairvoyance and mediumship, 15, magic and sorcery, dreams and vision, 16, astral influence, pneumatology, 17, philosophy of disease and medicine, 18, paramrum, the five causes of disease, chapter 19, medieval philosophy and theology, chapter 20, vampirism, witchcraft, and black art, their dangers and how to avoid them. That's going to be an interesting one, right? Uh, well, they all are. Uh, but chapter 21, the mystery of breath. Chapter 22, the influence of astral colors. Well, there are different ways to talk about the other worlds, right? Um, and 23, the symbol of jewels. 24, dreams and visions. Chapter 25, glossary, definition of occult terms.